Let's talk to the Home Office Minister this morning. Should we, Laura Farris? Hi, it's good to see you. Thanks for taking the time to join us on the programme this morning. Lots to talk to you about. Let's rattle through it as best we can. Should we start with a story that's on the front page of lots of the papers today, and that's the CAS report. Yeah. Um, will the government implement all of the report's recommendations? I think there's 32 altogether. Yeah, well, look, it's only just been published. We'll be looking at it really, really carefully. Um, I just want to pay tribute, actually, to Hilary Cass. This was a four-year piece of work. It's the most comprehensive piece of work that's ever been conducted into gender identity. We read her interim report that she published two years ago yes, very, did. very carefully. Her conclusions are broadly consistent with that. So we did have an idea of where she was going. We've so are you going to um, adopt them all? Well, look, I, I can't say yet because we haven't had a chance to read it. But we've all read... broadly similar to what it was two yeah, years we've ago. We've already started to implement... So, as you know, puberty blockers are no longer prescribed to children Indeed. on the NHS. We published schools guidance, guidance for all schools dealing with children who are questioning their gender, which was heavily informed by her interim... Um, review. So, yes, look, it's anticipated. We'll be looking at that very, very carefully. The report says there's a fear among doctors of appearing transphobic. What can you do to support them in that? Well, this is why the report was so important. In her interim report that she published two years ago, she said that there were doctors who felt under significant pressure Even to she adopt... Did when she was doing the report. ..to adopt an unquestioning affirmative approach to that. And that was one of the reasons why she said that has to change fundamentally. And, you know, that is why... I have to say the Tavistock Clinic is no longer. And we're going to have regional support centres across the United Kingdom so that a child presenting with gender, who's questioning their gender, will be given a holistic package of support, mental health support, neurodivergency support, yep. because that's a factor 2K. Yep. Um, and not just funnel down an irreversible pathway where they may find that they reach adulthood and then wonder, a bit like Kira Bell, that young woman, wonder how on earth they were ever allowed to take those steps. So... You must be asking that. As well. I mean, I was chatting to Mari about it this morning, saying, how could we be in a position where we were giving kids uh, puberty blockers? This has been a concern of mine ever since I was first elected. But can I just say one thing? Mm. In 2011, I think there were 250 children in the United Kingdom who were referred to gender identity services. In 2021, there were nearly 5,000 yes, children. Indeed. And that's been the case in many other similar countries to us. So I think it's a phenomenon that many countries have encountered, have struggled to grapple with, have felt some of the same pressures that Hilary Cass has referred to. And doctors. And doctors too. And I think this is the first, the most important and comprehensive report that's been written on all of that. We began the work on changing it after her interim report was published, but I think that you can expect to see a fundamental change of direction that comes out of this. And this is, you know, she is a top consultant paediatrician and nobody's ever looked at it with this kind of comprehensive, sensitive and a multidisciplinary eye uh, before. OK, you want to talk to me about shoplifters this morning? I do. Tell me. Yeah, well, look... At the moment, we have, we're very proud of our record on crime. We've got violent crime down 51% since we came in. Neighbourhood crime, stuff like burglary, car theft, that's down 48%. But one area where we have seen an increase, particularly in the last sort of 12 to 24 months, is in shoplifting and also assaults on re retail workers, which very often goes hand in hand with it. And so today we are announcing a standalone offence of assault on a retail worker um, that will be accompanied by a bespoke package of sanctions. Um, so, for example, if somebody is apprehended because they've abused or they've assaulted a retail worker, not only will they be sentenced for that, but they can expect to get a criminal behaviour order, which is a sort of protective order, meaning they probably can't go back to that shop or somewhere else, and they could they could be looking at five years in prison if they breach that order. Except and there's not a lot of room in prisons at the moment, is there? Well, we, we do have uh, room for this. We wouldn't be legislating if we didn't. Um, prisons are full, aren't they? Well, look, there is pressure on prison places. I will make that concession. But the reason for that is because we have a higher remand population. We've got... We normally have 9,000 people on remand. It's currently 15,000. That's to do with delays in the court. And they arose during COVID because we took the very challenging decision to maintain juries of 12 people during COVID because we thought that that was the cornerstone of the right to a fair trial. We accept that there are backlogs. Uh, three but, years ago, four years ago now, COVID. Yes, and we're getting the backlogs down. We do have prison places. But Sorry? How much longer will it take? Well, listen, we are launching the... We're in the middle of the biggest prison building 
programme since the Victorian era. We're bringing 20,000 places on stream. 5,000 of them have already arrived. Places like HMP Fossway, HMP Five, Five Wells. We've got uh, HMP Mill site coming on stream next year. So we're, we're getting on top of that. But look, I want to say one thing, Kay. One of the things we do envisage with these, because some of these offences on their own are quite low level. But one of the things we'll be doing, as well as criminal behaviour orders, is what repeat offenders will be subject to electronic tagging. And that isn't the old tagging that we had sort of 10, 15 years ago, where someone wore a radio tag and you could just about tell whether they'd left their home. This is GPS tagging that tells you, you know, within an inch where that person is. If they breach that, they'll have the sword of Damocles hanging over their head. They could be back in, or they could be going into prison. So we will be protecting shop workers. We've been working very closely with the retail industry. We had a round table at the Home Office with them last week. This is to send a clear message that it will not be tolerated. And we take the safety of people doing public facing jobs incredibly seriously. Others who find themselves in prison include um, convicted uh, sex offenders. Um, I know that you've seen our special report where a convicted sex offender who was seeking asylum, he went to, to prison, um, he was still allowed to stay in the UK because he would have been at risk of violence in Afghanistan. I'm sure many of our viewers this morning will think, that can't be right. Well, the principle of removal is that anybody who has a sentence of more than two years should be removed when they conclude that sentence. I'm, I'm not familiar with that case and I couldn't comment on it. He got, but... he got less than that. It is absolutely right that the public ex expect that foreign national offenders will be deported when their sentence is concluded. I make that concession and I will have to look into that particular case to see what happened. I'll be happy to take that back to the Home Office. But it's not the first time that that's happened, has it? And we saw that with uh, Azadi, who um, killed hit, or uh, used a caustic substance to uh, throw at his partner and his two little yeah. ones as well. So it looks as though there is some sort... It's not a one-off, is what I'm trying to say, as far as that was concerned, because we've got <coughs> evidence that it was happened on at least another occasion. I'm sure if we dug deeper, we would find even more. One of the things that was difficult about the Azadi case is that Home Office had rejected his application for asylum. Um, obviously, he hadn't committed the acid attack this at one the time. rejected as well. But, but it, his, his claim was allowed on appeal because he advanced grounds of a new religious belief, and that's something we're looking at very, very carefully in the Home Office, that people should not be allowed to use spurious grounds or grounds that, frankly, the public would, would expect to see scrutinised far more rigorously. And that, that is something that we're looking at very, very carefully, and particularly in relation to that case. But 50% of those that appeal, according to our report, are allowed to stay in the UK. Of those that are not allowed to stay, many of them just disappear. So we don't, um, we don't send them back to where they came from anyway. Well, look, can I just take your second point first? Yes. The reason we pass the Illegal Migration Act is to say that if you come to the United Kingdom illegally, irrespective of the strength of your claim for asylum, you'll either be removed to a safe third country where you'll have your claim adjudicated there, or to your home if you're, you don't qualify for asylum, um, and actually, we want to end this sort of merry-go-round of people coming in and advancing more and more grounds. Now, you made the point about people appealing and, and getting into the United Kingdom. I used to work in asylum law before, a bit before I became an MP. I can tell you're on comfortable ground. I, well, well, no, I, I just... But, uh, look, th there was always quite a high rate of people appealing Home Office decisions going back 10, 20, 30 years. That's not a new thing. One of the things that we're determined to end is the merry-go-round that we've seen a bit. And one of the things that people do do is when they go to appeal, they're not advancing the same case. They're often bringing in new evidence, saying something's changed about my story, that's why you might look at it differently. And we're determined to clamp down on that through the Illegal Migration Act. But as I said, 50% um, are just successful on appeal. The others, we don't know where many of them are. But just to be clear before I let you go, should asylum seekers convicted of sex crimes ever, ever be allowed to stay in the UK? My preference would be no. I, the only reason why I equivocate slightly is that, you know, there are sometimes competing things. So sometimes, for example, um, the sex crime could be sort of a viewing offence or something, and they might at the same time have a very profound other argument, for example, you know, a human rights argument that was very, very strong, that would have to be considered, not that they should remain, but we must balance everything together. You know, the law, the legal framework applies, but by and large, their sex offenders should be removed from the United Kingdom. We're clear on that. Even if they're going to be sent back to places like Afghanistan where they would uh, potentially have their lives at risk? This is the point of our Illegal Migration Act and the partnerships that we're forming with Rwanda and other countries. We're not sending people back to places where they would, their lives would be at risk. So you wouldn't send but them back to But we want to, to have safe 
third, third partner third countries where we can send them because we do not want illegal migrants in the United Kingdom. We're clear on that. We must leave it there. Thank you for being so Thanks frank with your answers. Always appreciate it.